here. And I don't know if everybody knows this, but now you can for free turn on live transcript and, Whoa. Uh, and all of a sudden you get live record of what was actually said without having to submit it to some other service or device or whatever else. It's kind of cool. And, mm -hmm. and, then, and then when you get your Zoom downloads, you get a fourth file or however many you've selected to get. I get now four, one of which is now a transcript. It's like, ooh, this is good. That's so cool. So I've turned that on. If you click on the live transcript button um, and you can select having it having a subtitle, it's um, it's interesting to see how it chooses to translate uh, mumbling. Yes, um, <laughs> and all, and also you'll see it cor correct mistranslations. So um, you can you can see it unfold in front of you as, as if you kind of stare at it. It's, it's a little mesmerizing because it'll misrecognize something and then back backtrack, correct it, and and improve it. It's really pretty wild. Wow. We've been busy. Yeah, it's Bo. Yo, Bo. I miss Bo. Hey, hey, everybody. I miss catching up on Susan. What's going on, Susan? Oh, um, we're having fire weather. <clears throat> oh. And uh, let's see, that's always a little startling. And um, I just was finishing. I won't go into it, but I was. I was decided to go back and read. Finish cast by Isabel Wick Wick Wilkerson, and uh, because I was thinking about how is this different from just plain old power stuff, mm. and um, I found it was different in one important way, which is she has a far more nuanced analysis of the election about how it is that people vote um, not by these blocks that we think they vote in and all of the statistics that we collect, but rather in traits of people that they would like to be like. Ooh, as mm. functional voting. Hmm. I'll leave you with that thought because- uh, Actually, don't leave us with that thought. Could you just uh, untangle it just a little bit more? Um, um, well, okay, so uh, yes, I will, but I'm gonna get the book out so I don't screw it up. Thank you. And I, I started the book and then dropped it, and it's in the it's in this horrible trail of opened and barely read books in my Kindles, uh, you know, playlist. So. Well, I I dropped it, and then I asked myself that question, and I thought, well, you could finish the book and see, you know. Yep, and it's really good. I love I love the as far as I got into it. it it's it's amazing at the end. I mean, it gets very uh, storytellish, mm -hmm. and has a lots and lots of provocative examples. Um, okay, so she she argues for the caste system. She, um, I mean, regarding our our own societies in some cases as having a caste system. Um, it's not the most felicitous term for the phenomenon, but I think she does a good job of pulling it out and separating it. It, seem, it seems to have rich histories in different places that are similar but really different. Right, but she's you know she she did an analysis where she pulled out the three the three pillars or the okay. how work right, and she said look this is what this is what they have in common. Cool. Um, but I think it's really interesting when it has a you know she can use it to use the framework to analyze events. For instance, uh, she said in the pivotal election of 2016, whether a oh here we go. Uh, people with overlapping self-interests and who's, <laughs> we don't know anybody like that, do we? <laughs> um, will often gravitate toward the personal characteristic that accords them the most status. Mm. Many make an existential aspirational choice. They vote up rather than across and usually not down. They believe they know who will protect the interests of the straight that gives them the most status and that matters the most to them. In the pivotal election of 2016, whether consciously or not, the majority of whites voted for the candidate who made the most direct appeals to the characteristic most rewarded in the caste system. They went with the aspect of themselves that grants them the most power and status in the hierarchy. 
So oh. interesting. Uh, Kevin, welcome to the call. We're talking about the book Cast, The origin of, Origins of Our Discontents. And Susan's gone back and, and finished it and just reporting back on it a little bit. Go ahead, Susan, sorry. So anyway, so that point, that very point saying that, that what we vote, that what people vote for, the majority of whites, for instance, and then she gives some data below. Uh, majority of whites, for instance, voted for the candidate who made the most direct appeals to the characteristic most rewarded in the caste system. They went with the aspect of themselves that grants them the most power and status in the, in the hierarchy. So that's so, a different explanation. Yeah. For, yeah, the white vote. Yeah. Uh, and it seems plausible to me. Um, so what would be the differences in the definition that I just caught the end of and the phrase enlightened self-interest? Maybe not enlightened. <laughs> no, I understand. I just wanted to know. I mean, yeah. it's it's it. I mean, she does say she doesn't argue for this, but she does say that it's we're not necessarily aware of this. Mm. No. And uh, mm. and that's what makes it so insidious, I think. Um. So, for instance, according to New York Times exit polling of 24,537 respondents, 58% of white voters chose the Republican Donald Trump and only 37% went for the Democrat Hillary Clinton. So all those people that won't really tell you the truth on a poll uh, will or will deceive themselves even. When they're I was very off. leery of single causal explanation. It could very well be that you have people who voted for Trump because they thought it would be funny. And, yes. and they also had, you know, there was an element that it, it wouldn't hurt them in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, there are people who well, voted for Trump. Probably people who thought he wouldn't win, even if they voted for him. People who thought he wouldn't win, but it was a protest vote, or they didn't like mm -hmm. Hillary, or what, you know, for whatever reason, whatever set of reasons. Yes. And, and so when I see that such and such was the reason that Trump won, it sort of gets my hackles up. And I know that's not what you were saying. I don't think she says that. That was my my very loose interpret interpretation yeah. there. Okay. And I don't believe in the single cause either. I think I think what was interesting to me was that it distributes the causes across a different space. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. oh, I love that phrase. Yeah. It's great, Susan. Yeah. I and mean, that's what this framework does. And I, I would go with that, actually. Um, so I've been I, worried about. I I've love been worried about this question for a while. Here's the here's my here's what I've collected on why do people support Trump. I'll I'll share the link to this in the chat. <laughs> oh, look at this! <laughs> you see? <laughs> oh, this would be awesome. And I've got to add a paraphrase of what you just said to that collection now, uh, Susan. So I'm trying to figure out how to phrase it. Um, and 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 the first thought I had, not being my brain not being fresh about cast, but thinking about cast differences and status differences, which was really interesting, was. The miracle that Donald Trump, who is a better caricature of the greedy, selfish billionaire than Thurston Howell III on Gilligan's Island and Scrooge McDuck, like really he outdoes both of them in that stereotype character, how he could be seen as every man and as friendly to your average, you know, blue collar worker in the middle of the country. They saw him as them. And that that is this like conceptual leap that maybe that's continues not to what astonish was going me. on. I mean, maybe, 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 maybe they were connecting themselves to, to him to pull themselves up to his perceived golden toilet status. He hated the same people they hate. That too. Yeah, no, that's a so good many point. things. Yeah, actually, he was hated by the people they hated. One of the things that that I read recently uh, that came out of early Trump interviews was um, they like me because I'm hated by rich people. The enemy and, of my and, and I thought that was pardon? <laughs> yeah. the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So kind of. And and yeah. I thought that was very self-perceptive. Like, like I think I think he understands. And when I say he's a caricature of the eccentric billionaire, I think it's very intentional. Mm. Mm. But to go he back also had to the you... benefit of uh, you know, through the apprentice and shows like that of, of uh presenting himself as something to identify with. You're fired. I mean, it's both funny and in some sense that was kind of the response to America that people, you know, wanted to give. I saw a but clip I of him in the, 
No, so it's very, very one brief. comment before I, you, you continue, because sure. I wanted to ask you, <laughs> I wanted to ask you whether, I mean, this business of multiple causes, I mean, here we are in this conversation trying to pick out all these reasons. And, um, and, and if it's really many, many, many different things, how do we, how do we, how do we understand that differently? So we keep finding all these things that are plausible, but in fact, we don't know. It, it, it's a complex landscape. landscape. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's a it's a large landscape, and mm -hmm. I think it stands in stark contrast to political polling and the ways that the um, that the uh, political you know stuff is measured and thought about. I mean, it it they, it really contradicts that because of its its spread. Well, Susan, the design of a lot of the things I say, are you for or against? Yes, that's and, you know, so there, you know, there's no in between, there's no gray area. It's just, you know, you have to answer. It's like going on the stand and testifying. Answer yes or no. All right. Well, that's when did you stop beating your wife? <laughs> right. So, yes. you know, these are leading questions that are done by pollsters, and they don't necessarily reflect, as Jamey was saying, the true nuance of you know, all of the forces, right? And so that's a pollster, um, you know, flatland view of, you know, instant opinion, right? And sometimes not very predictive, is it? So uh, just a couple of simple observations, right? Um, for context, uh, born on Ohio, moved to Central Florida, Cocoa Beach, Merritt Island when I was nine, raised in the Space Coast. Um, and I've got four older brothers, four older sisters, one younger sister, and I'm probably uh, all by myself on the island who didn't vote for Trump. So there's that. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the thing about Trump, I think, was first off, systems completely broken, it's completely crooked, and I need somebody to come in and just smash it all down, somebody who can't be bought because you know they're a self-made man, and I've seen this guy on TV and I trust him. Mm -hmm. So there's that. The big reset. Um, I think um, <laughs> the second thing is uh, he's the first person that I associate with that is looking out for me. And this comment comes from great conversation I had with my brother and one of my older sisters about as awkward and as uncomfortable as you feel right now in year two of the Trump administration, Brad. That's how I felt throughout the entire eight years of Obama. Okay. And America emerged that I didn't recognize. Uh, it didn't resonate with my values. It didn't represent me. And in fact, it was highly threatening to everything I believe in and everything that I feel that I've owned and earned. And so I'm thrilled that there's a reset. And I'm actually kind of a little giddy that you and your liberal friends are all feeling just as uncomfortable as I had to feel for eight mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that was a big aha and then the third thing is the thing i never really understood i was raised christian scientist which is a whole nother topic we'd love to get into sometime but in merritt island florida the biggest church was a southern baptist church that was very black and white evangelical you know and it was so black and white that it was one of the biggest churches because it was one of those populated churches, most well-funded churches. And it was well-funded by a bunch of scientists and engineers that worked at NASA. And what really was trippy for me as I tried to deconstruct this in my early 20s and 30s was, how could some of the smartest people that I know be so freaking stupid and blind? How is it even possible? But because they live in a universe where things are sorted, things are black, things are white, and that's how the world works. This was a highly convenient belief system that just kind of plugged into their DNA. And so I think that's the third arc, right? Very intelligent people supported Trump for very pragmatic reasons because they knew exactly what they were getting. Sure, he's a racist. Absolutely. You know what? There's always been racism. No big deal. Is he going to help me with my taxes? Heck yeah. So I'll, I'll buy that all day. I don't care about the future or the consequence. It just fits my, my niche. Mm -hmm. So these, these are the things that I walk away from. And, and then finally, of course, the obvious, 
Trump isn't unique. Trump is an emergent of a property that's always been there lurking underneath the surface. And he was just the first incarnation of this thing in the physical space that you could touch and see. Can I point something else about this conversation? Okay, so we're, we're, we're thinking of it, we're talking about it as if an individual is making a choice. And some of this is conscious and I completely agree with you. I mean, that's, there's a lot of that that probably was going on is, is that, you know, we, we don't, we should take into account and bring onto the table, you know, the social construction of, right? When people don't know what, who to vote for, right? Or they don't want to be embarrassed at the dinner table when somebody says, I hope you <laughs> voted for Trump. Right. Um, that, that's a very powerful force as well, which isn't reflected either mm -hmm. in, the, in any of the, you know, the statistics or anything else. Um, but I wanted to point out one more thing about the media and throw it on the table. I was thinking this is nice getting a whole bunch of stuff on the table. Uh, the, uh, um, the media, uh, oh, I've been studying, I mean, the thing that, hmm. I've been watching the headlines. I mean, I, I go through the Washington Post, the New York Times, the LA Times. Uh, no Fox Economist, News? Said this. What? No Fox News, no OANN? No I, I made no myself Breitbart? watch it once, <laughs> you know, and I mean, I, I know that, yes. And, and my neighbor said, you have to watch The Symptoms. Simpsons. You have no idea what the rest of the world is thinking. He's probably right. I so, get all my news through Joe Rogan. Is that a bad thing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. None of us is good all the way through anyway. Yeah. So uh, I just don't know. Sorry, sorry, I don't know sorry, how sorry. to grapple with this system where everything is so individuated and people do things like this without also bringing in the, the, social, the social structure, the social influences that people are under at the same time. But the, the other thing is that the media is like the yes, no, who pointed that out? We're only getting sort of like, do you want this or that? You know? yeah. But if you look at the headlines in the newspapers and in the journals, uh, there's always a question, is it, this, is it possible that this is what's happening or something? It's always a, well, they don't say it that way, that would be better, <laughs> but it's always a, a yes or no, posed yes or no. And the presupposition is always the answer they want you to have. Mm. So it's a leading the, question. The news, the news that they want to tell you is, is presupposed in the question that they ask almost always. Yeah. What I, what I really like about this is, and I want you to have the, the chance to completely ask explicate the thesis as much as possible. So what I really like about this book from what, from what I've, I'm briefly reading on Wikipedia and hearing from you is uh, it's, it's how it's an identity thing. It's identity and identity is very complex, but I like the I like the identity component of this because I think that's a great deal of what's going on. Well, I, and aspirational identity too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you are, when you're voting, you're, you're, you are thinking about the future not always in a self-interested fashion. Um, yeah, the identity and community research, you know, kind of what yeah. you were talking about, Brad, a moment ago, yeah. um, I can't point to the source. Um, so excuse me, but that when there's a narrative that you've heard since childhood repeated, it shuts off your prefrontal cortex and your critical sure. thinking, you simply yeah. go into a different modality. And so, working at NASA and belonging to that, you know, Baptist church, right, are two different realities, right, sure. that you would never bring that quality of thinking to your work at NASA, yeah. right, and vice versa, you're not going to bring rocket science into the congregation, right, right? so it, it's very interesting because, you know, the, uh, which tribe are you part of, well, I'm part of, you know, two main tribes, yeah. scientists and i have you know this you know narrative from you know that imprinted on me in childhood right yeah. so um they're not necessarily in incongruous but the uh, the identity part is that we have multiple identities ties back to your we don't have that's, one identity that's brilliant yeah no that makes a lot of sense i like that and i think we go in and out of as those of us who've been party to the social identity stories notice that that when you um, you go into you know when you when you think when you're talking about identity, um, we the identity is socially influenced terribly, right? 
but many of us can go into into in and out of many different little communities of practice, if you will, <laughs> and we're comfortable and we adopt that perspective when we're in them. So you don't notice necessarily that it's, it's hard to see the contradictions between your work, you know, at NASA. That makes sense. Yep. And and everything else because it's it, it, you have people around you. I mean, I used to say, and when I was back in the day when I gave talks, was that you know you do you should worry terribly about who your kids are hanging out with. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. just 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 you know that is you know my my mother was uh, well I was thinking about this last night actually who died some years ago now a few and uh, I had a friend who was um, I mean I you know I grew up in this very small closed Mennonite community and ended up with a friend in junior high who was uh, in a family of it with an alcoholic father, 14 kids and everything else. And she decided she didn't want to be part of that. And so she tried to make friends with me. And I think my mother did her best to help, help us, the two of us, uh, to do things that she felt were more appropriate than what I might get into with her. Um, even though the irony was that she was, she was looking to not go to the parties that everybody else she knew was going to. Mm -hmm. right. Girlfriends were getting pregnant and blah, blah, blah. So interesting. So, uh, yeah. Susan, you still give talks. You just have a much smaller audience right here. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> I'm, That's true. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm going to give my bona fides as well as Brad. Uh, Growing up partly in Wyoming, where my, my parents divorced, uh, I lived in a town of 150 mm -hmm. uh, in a valley that was 90% Mormon. And uh, there isn't anyone there who isn't a Trumper. And right. I was hearing stuff uh, when Obama was the last election, uh, when Obama's second term. Uh, it was common for me to hear from members of my own family, uh, Obama's not going to let the election go. There's a bunch of... Uh, uh, agents out in the desert going to go take our guns. And what's so interesting when I look back on it is they were already, you know, they were saying Obama wasn't going to let the election go. They were projecting what they themselves were going to do. That was very fascinating when I look yeah. back on it that. So I just want to <clears throat> give that I too, Brad, know what you're talking about. And I, I do, I'm friends with a bunch of these people I grew up with in Miami on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And it, the stuff that they post is truly horrifying. It's, it's fascinating how fast facts get turned into a twisted meme. I am, I, and, and I mean, remain friends with them because I want to see reality. I want to see what's coming at me. So, yeah, no, I mean, I, I feel like the CIA, like, okay, yeah, no, so people, you know what I mean? Yeah, no. So, my, so my little sister, um, three years my junior, sold her house in Florida and moved to a patch of land in Kentucky um and is living in a trailer and completely content that now she has over 3800 facebook friends and she spends her entire day posting easily 40 to 50 to 70 posts mm. every bit of it is reposts nothing original mm. and that's that's her that's her gig you know mm -hmm. and she's in the deepest darkest parts of all of this craziness and I wondered how often do you hear about George Soros or like <laughs> yeah. you, you name yeah. the amount of just yeah. straight up anti-Semitism and you you name it. Oh. Codes are right there. It's so clear. Right. Yeah. We had worked with um, you know, this project hasn't gone anywhere, but we proposed to FEMA with the Choice Flows business a study um, that if the Cascadia fault were to actually occur. What is the willingness of the states that are to the east, interior of the you know, states that we affected, to take in refugees, right? right? U.S. citizens, but generally we're not. I think that we would we have indications through qualitative research that some of those citizens would look at those people coming in uh, the same way that Californians looked at people migrating from Oklahoma during the Dust Bowl right? Sure. That they would be very unwelcome, right? So um, we have not quantified that hypothesis, but we have, you know, soft indications that there's a problem, you know, that would occur if you know, <clears throat> people had to move from west to east. 
I want to give, I want to give a slight aphorism. So my um my hairdresser is a is a right winger, and she took her Obama money and like bought a cabin that has no power outside of Oregon, and she's moving out of town. So I mean, she's a full <laughs> thing, okay? Yes. Right. And uh, I asked her, hey, uh, if you watch the Squid Game, so this is getting back to the thesis in the book that Susan. <laughs> I asked, her, did you um did you, did you um see the Squid Game? And she said. You think I want to watch a program where I, where I see what the rich people do to people like me? I know, already know what they want to do to me. Talk about cast identity. <laughs> and I, I, I couldn't disagree with her. I'm like, yeah, you pretty much got yeah. that. <laughs> so a, a couple of things, a couple of things I just want to throw in. One, I was reading last week that it seems that uh, the Idaho hospitals are overwhelmed. And so lots of people from Idaho are showing up in Portland hospitals. Uh, lots of people who would like greater Idaho to be a state and are probably Trumpers are, are being taken care of over here. Uh, then two other things. One is <clears throat> this, this habit of projection of basically stating out loud what your intentions are and accusing and accusing the other side of the malfeasance that you are committing is a common, common thing and is, is in fact an offensive strategy. Uh, it's like, you know, and if you look at Trump, all the accusations made about uh, about Democrats and socialism and all that kind of stuff, it's like, holy crap, it, it's like, it's exactly what they're doing. Yeah. And then and, and then the third observation is um, very, uh, lots and lots and lots of people make decisions, vote, make personal choices, buy stuff, depending on what their neighbors and their tribe are doing. And when your entire neighborhood is Trump and everybody's like, yes. fuck you, the government is broken. This is this is a big fuck you to the government. Join us there. It, I can completely understand how those folks can't understand that somebody different won the election because there is nobody in their life and in their media, nobody that was going to vote for the opposition. Yeah. Biden was not on the, the radar uh, image for them. Uh, in particular, if they're down several rabbit holes and are only looking at Fox News and everything else, it was like it was, like, it was just inconceivable that someone else could actually earn enough votes to to beat their their dude, right? And I I, I get how people would be very convinced of that. You know, there. Yes, of course. I, I mean, we're all. I mean, part of the the whole thing about being able to sort of categorize thing in short term and long term memory and sorting it all out in your dreams and your sleep and the whole rest of that stuff is to get a lot of the crap out of the way. And it's not yep. surprising that we end up with a lot of stuff that is self reinforcing. Um, I don't know, there must be some neuroscience on that somewhere. I'm sure I'm sure lots of neuroscientists are working on these puzzles right now. Well, I don't <laughs> in, in it, it is, it is the perfect storm. In so many ways, but you know the the article that's still haunting me, Jerry, is the one I shared with you about the military veterans know why your employees are leaving, and it's talking about how the fact that COVID universally created an experience that's very much like soldiers going off to war and then coming home and having problems plugging back into normal because normal isn't normal anymore, and they can't trust that it's normal or not, and it's like this you know, this reacclimation period and people have been so stressed out because of COVID that, you know, they've gone into their self-reflective bunkers, they're seeking information and that's allowed the rabbit holes just to go bigger and deeper and harder than ever before. Cause I'm already isolated. So I may as well just, you know, find people like me with problems and fears like mine and, and find community because I don't get to talk to my diverse neighbors anymore because we're not allowed to see each other outside. So, you know, I think, I think there's been just this Venturi tube of amplification that, that's, that's hit us at the same time. Just uh, apropos perfect storm, here's a thought I've been curating since the Boogaloo kind of seemed to start. So, yeah. <clears throat> so this is coronavirus plus Black Lives Matters plus suddenly the Boogaloo, does this equal the perfect storm? Is this the start of our meltdown? And we've, we've managed to avoid meltdown and elect Biden and a bunch of other things in the meantime, but that doesn't mean that this isn't actually actually stopping. Um, so I'll, I'll share a link to that in the chat. How many of you have heard this uh, latest speculation about instead of a civil war, we'll have something like um, Northern Ireland in the troubles coming up on the war? Yeah, I mean, it, it can't be a civil war because there's no easy geography. Unless you were to split the coasts or something like that, that that'd be interesting, but the geography is lousy for this. But, but some kind of- 
So some kind of insurgency or guerrilla warfare could easily happen. The attempt to kidnap that governor, for example, to me is, not, is a bit like that. Go ahead, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was going to say it's the Indian partition. Actually, so, the phrase that that I like that even though it comes from an odious source, uh, marginal ta trailer green, um, talking about uh, a national divorce. Right. And I thought that actually captures the some of the nuances. Mm -hmm. um, I have to run. Uh, so you guys all have a, a good rest of the month. Oh, and no, I'll you're see supposed you to help us figure this out. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <And> unfortunately, <laughs> I have a ton of writing to do for a on scenarios of California in 10, 50, and 100 years. Oh, wow, sweet. Okay. I yeah. can't wait you post that on Twitter and I'll read it. Uh, <laughs> It will actually, I don't know, I can't post it on Twitter yet, but it will be all very public when, when with part of a whole California 100 project coming out in a few months. Well, I live in California, so I have a vested interest, so please yes, share. Yes, so I'll do it. Can. Yes, yes, you can. <laughs> Hi, Jimmy. Okay. Thanks, Jimmy. Bye. Take care, sir. Yes. <laughs> one, one, thing, one thing that also dawned on me is the entire fabric of democracy is dependent upon all of us commit to a shared idea, which is written down on a piece of paper. It's kind of the silliest thing in the human experience to ever imagine, right? The source of authority is a bunch of words that a bunch of people wrote back in the day. And we all, we all, can, we all agree to the social contract, right? And one of the big aha learnings I had during the Black Lives Matter process and as I got educated in that world was simply put, when I, you know, if I'm an NFL player and I'm not going to stand during the Pledge of Allegiance or the National Anthem, it's because it represents an America that doesn't represent me. Like, I don't mm -hmm. see myself anywhere in this Constitution. I don't see the Constitution protecting any of my rights. So why should I give it the same respect that everybody else has when it doesn't reflect me? And now I'm seeing this huge pivot on the other side that says legitimate political protest of course. was, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, January 6th. Those people clearly don't believe the Constitution represents them either. And so this 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 concept of a great divorce um, is quite fascinating because people no longer abide to that idea that you know, the constitution, democracy, and, and the rights reflect all of us. But you so know, how do you, how do you repair that? Exactly. Oh, but I like Jamie's, you know, comment that he threw out just before he left regarding, it's more like India, part, the partition mm -hmm. of India. Um, when, um, and you think about, you know, that, that Pakistan and Bangladesh maybe have their Muslimhood in, in, in common, but they really have nothing much in common anymore. Nope. Right. So if that's the left and the coast and the, the right coast, right. And that is a religious difference. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, we want to. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of the many causes, and I do, uh, you know, the more and more I put the pieces together that uh, the working class has been losing for 50 years. And it turns out the way our, our taxation of our corporations worked. I just keep discovering more and more. For example, um, we weighted taxes heavily on payroll taxes, mm -hmm. which means that any company that employed a lot of people had to either figure out a way not to do so or export the jobs. <clears throat> so it, there's just so many ways. So by the way, the winners in all of these, the way the taxation and fiscal policy have worked have been educated, computers, anything that's not a lot of people again and again and again and again and again. And it, it's stark, stark to see like literally the cronyism that's gone on. I can't believe if you, the, the tax rate for corporations looks like a ski slope. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that they put it on payroll taxes, that's like they're making the people pay it. And uh, it's just, just watching this, it's just, I sit there and go, uh, the, and we said when Clinton did the WTO, they said, well, we know we're going to have to upskill the workers. Never happened. Never, Never happened. Never. But I specifically want to say this, I don't want a single cause. I think this is one stressor. It's not all of it, yeah. but it's been big been a big part just drop well on. the disparity is the disparity of wealth and the and the ratios of the wealth disparity 
historically throughout the whole of history, nothing good ever happens when it hits these numbers. No. The last time this happened, it was like, yeah, it's not good. Mm -mm. And that's oh, why I do, I do think the social contract has to be rewritten. Um, the last time we did this in the depression, uh, it was it was things were really bad, and they literally went around to the rich people and said, "You're gonna have to pay more taxes." And uh, yep, what about health care for these people? What about unemployment? All these things that we're looking at happened under the Roosevelt administration, and happened under severe duress, where the elites basically said, "Uncle," because also don't forget that before that, the FBI was chasing around people who were bombing in America. Don't we we had times like this before? We had yeah. anarchism. It wasn't just. Marxist scares. There was lots of discontent in America um, in, in the Gilded Age. Okay. Yeah. And I would say that um, we have evidence to support what you're saying, but it wasn't necessarily all government. You know, the, some of the, you know, leading banking and business interests came together and said, you know what, it's in our best interest to figure out how to do this, right? We don't have anyone that has that a much civic mindedness left to come together, right? The way that you're suggesting. I, I hope that we, we do. I hope we, we gain that capacity, but I'm not seeing it at the moment. And don't forget, FDR was one of them. He was an American aristocrat. 100%. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> talking to everybody he went to school with and everyone he grew up with. I mean, he was yeah. plugged in with the very people to make the deal with. Yeah, 100%. I just want to make, I got went off camera for a moment. I just want to tell you guys quickly why. Because since January 3rd, <clears throat> like your friend with a cabin, uh, the Clark household has been off the grid. We didn't move, but the tree fell, pulled out the electrical mass from the roof, right? And disconnected uh -huh. us from the electrical grid. And my, you know, uh, Mitsubishi diesel engine connected to the natural gas line has been running the house for a month and a half. Wow. Right? That's incredible. So, so Wait, number one, welcome, it's a testament to, to my world. <laughs> yeah. It's a testament to a Japanese diesel engine, right? For one thing. Absolutely. Uh, but the electrical people are here and putting stuff back on top of the house. So I hope by the end of the day tomorrow, I will be back on the grid. Back. Hmm. You know, um, sucking the juice from the main line as opposed to making it on our <laughs> own. All right, and the, we have that's, clearly that's worn out the bearings, power. but it, it it's it's making some noises. The bearings on the um, dynamo, we've clearly stressed it. <laughs> mm. Mm. So, it's time. That's amazing. That's a long time. It is. I mean, uh, I go to bed. Say, please keep running. <laughs> Yeah, I've been doing this for, I've been, I have to say, you know, I'm off the grid, have been for 37, eight years now. And, uh, you know, I've, I've had many nights like that, like, you know, <laughs> equipment. but, um, you know, and I think I told this group last time that, that, you know, having, I just have to, to express my pleasure at having a Tesla power wall and uh, mm -hmm. new panels, mm -hmm. half mm -hmm. the panels with three or four times amount, amount of, you know, electricity. And I can go to bed and once in a while, something does kind of blip out, mm -hmm. but I sleep better. I bet. Well, good for you. I, I'm, I'm thinking about putting that on the office. I have some solar right now, mm -hmm. but it's enough solar to run the, the notebook computers and the printers. And it's, it's really not enough to run the house. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm thinking about scaling that up. So well, you like Tesla. Well, the people that I've been talking to, and I've talked to many over the years, um, there are now competitors to Tesla out there. I don't know how they rank. I know that our installers, um, our installers said Tesla is the only thing right now. Mm. And, and they said it works. You know, if there's a problem, it's not the Tesla. Yeah. And, uh, and so I've had to learn all kinds of other things that can go wrong. Like, you yeah. know, it doesn't like temperatures below 50 degrees. So I have to put a blanket on it, you know? Yeah, I mean, the, a lot of people who have done what you're doing um, go back and provide secondary wiring systems. So they have lighting that's running DC instead of going through an inverter yeah. because it's just more efficient. Yeah, we've done that. We've done that. Uh, when we moved here, we had a trailer we lived in a mobile home for six years. We were supposed to be there for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, um, 
of course, our marry our marriage or whatever it was partnership was much happier in that trailer than we ever were after that. Um, and uh, it had 12 volt. Okay. Uh, we didn't put it in here because it, it was going to be really direct current is really expensive uh, mm -hmm. to run because if you have something big, it's you got to have these giant cables. Mm -hmm. And and now the the solar panels come with their own inverters. Yeah. So they transmit AC, which is another one of the miracles. Yeah, all, all of my uh, think pads that were running on the uh, space shuttle and up on the space station that are still working, yeah. were all converted to 37 volts DC, which is an Air Force NASA standard. Uh -huh. You don't want to touch that wire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That would be bad. <laughs> yes. Yes. So let me scroll back in our conversation for just one second to rethinking the social contract and ask a positive question, um, which is, um, hey, who have you seen out there who's doing a good job rethinking the social contract at any scale in any way? And so here's, mm -hmm. uh, here's that thought in my brain. This is, this is the link I just shared in the chat. And, you know, uh, rethinking capitalism is, uh, is sort of wrapped in here. There's a bunch of... Uh, uh, you know, can capitalism be fixed? Uh, is there other other systems? Uh, e even things like voting are, you know, like how would how should we be making collective decisions? And then my um, my shorthand for this, um, I've got an open question, which is, what are our next stacks? And here I'm borrowing solution stacks like mm. the Lamp Stack, Linux, uh -huh. Apache, uh, you know, MySQL, etc. And I'm asking, um, what are our next stacks? And I'm proposing that there's two of them. There's a societal stack and an organizational stack. And 50 years down the road, there may not be two. But right now, there's the way we run our country, uh, politics, voting, uh, contributions to political parties, da, 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 da. Uh, and the country has journalism and courts and what appears to be democracy, but is turning into illiberal democracy a lot. But that's what's happening to this top stack. And then the bottom stack is, C corps and four hundred one C threes and you know all, all the different structures of how we organize businesses, which are also under under attack and in, uh, you know up for debate. It's like, hey, uh, Web three thinks that uh, national boundaries don't matter and that organizational boundaries don't matter. We should all just live in DAOs and vote our shares in the DAO on where we're going to turn uh, next. And that's. That is one proposal for one of the next stacks. And I'm like, whoa, big, big stuff is happening right now. Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons that, uh, you know, I, I, I could understand what you're saying, Jerry, in terms of convergence is that a lot of people live in companies that are functionally autocracies or illiberal democracies, and therefore they are comfortable seeing it in their governance, right? Um, because they voluntarily turned over part of their consciousness to, you know, an existence in exchange for a salary, right? Um, and they need to understand the difference between, you know, being a citizen and being an employee, right? Mm -hmm. But they're blurring, right? Uh, the reality is blurring. And so you don't have the same stark discomfort. And so you're a little, you're having a little bit of an Al Aldous Huxley moment. <laughs> <laughs> that that we're, we're, we're comfortable inside of our, self-imposed imprisonment, right? Uh, and we, it doesn't feel like we are, but indeed, you know, here it is. Anyone else? Uh, there's another, yes, there's a, that's yeah. another way to describe this, 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 um, can you, before you go on to your next scenario, <laughs> um, <laughs> on, on the two sides there, uh, there's another way to look at that, another way to look at that difference, which I then don't, don't know how to resolve, which is, the very um, the work that years and years ago um, and SC and I did and um, mm. on and and I was trying to describe the difference between um, authorized organization and um, emergent or social organization. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and that distinction, whether it's authorized or not, you know, it depends by whom, right? But the people there, there is something like where people don't want to participate in anything, but they still have to be part of some community or not, or as, as I am living here by myself. <laughs> I gave up, you know, uh, many years ago. And um, 
so that's that's a distinction that drives different things. So I don't know what happens when that those two, uh, the authorized, the the social starts to refuse the authorized. Mm. Um, and um, I mean, it's authored, right? That's what, what that word is for. It's authored, it's written down. It's, it's something that people agreed to. And it's its own system and it works its own way, right? And then there's all this social stuff on the side that it interleaves with. It's not like they're separate. Well, the, let, me, let me go back for a second to the people agreed to thing. And Brad, you kind of put that in the conversation earlier. I'm not sure, I think we're born into a situation and we, we kind of accept our situation. We don't ever sign a contract that says that we don't read the details. If we're lucky, we get a good civics teacher in school who says, hey, by the way, this is what's actually in the Constitution. And That's these right. are your rights. And here's what's going on. Most people are civically illiterate entirely. They're busy being happy consumers of whatever it is that the forces that be put in front of them. So I'm not sure that there's any kind of po affirmative, positive agreement to the contract or even an awareness to the contract. There's this like growing up inside of some environment. And then we talked a moment ago in the negative part of the conversation sort of about, holy crap, if everybody around you is going that down that direction, you're going to join them. And it's going to feel really unnatural. And it's not, a, it's not everyone. It's everyone, it's the, everyone that you care about or are in touch with, right? Yes. And well, I, it, I mean, if you, if you, how many of you, like some of us, <laughs> who lived in Wyoming or lived with the Mormons or, you know, got out of, left, you know, mm -hmm. a very tight community. Um, sometimes I think it's a curse because I can see so much. Right. I can see all these different things. Right. I can yeah. see them happening. I don't even know what to do about them, right? I have no idea even how to talk to people about that whole thing. Oh, Susan, are you so, talking to the fact that when you walk into a situation from a you know an odd situation, you can see all the stuff they're accepting as normal as as given, and you're like, no, wow, you guys decided this. You, 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 no, I don't think I don't think they decided it. It's no, it's 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 it well, is socially I'm, I'm, enforced. I mean, these two systems, the, the things that get authorized, okay, by somebody, right, and some system is different in many ways to those it has similar effects to the really tight social constraints that one might live under. But I'm if you suggest... leave one of those social, social things and you go to another place, if you don't notice that it's just another social thing, <laughs> I mean, that's what, you know, going to India when you're 16 and traveling around and seeing the caste system and seeing all of this stuff going on, right? And the differences and the similarities because you're not part of it. You can stand outside it a little bit and look at it. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. Mm -hmm. So I might suggest that the people who have some awareness because of what they needed to do to become citizens, if you become a citizen of the United States, there's a certain amount of knowledge that you have to acquire to be able to you know, obtain citizenship. That same knowledge base to become a citizen needs to be taught in the schools. Yeah. The basic you know, uh, knowledge of being a citizen that, as you said, Jerry, that you're born into, all of that needs to be reintroduced into the curriculum because it's all evaporated. Uh, so I'm, sure. I, I'm unclear that I would rely on the curriculum and schooling to do this. I think oh. that we're not, we're not living as, as citizens anymore. We're not, we're not. Well, then what's in the, the venue in which it would get delivered? Real life. Like mm -hmm. our community should be living this way. We should be working this way together. Well, we I think, I think, yeah, some level of conscribed service, you know, you, you join a transport, you join a local thing, you get indoctrinated into what it means to be a citizen and in return, I'll pay for your four-year degree in college or whatever. Yeah, two years um, of civic service would be great. Yeah, something on oh, yeah. right, one so, year. So Brad, in the suggestion you just made, that's fine, but the elites that have no need for it, they're right. going to be completely free of that knowledge. True. So that's a that 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 creates a, another divide, right? Yep. That's unhealthy. So I would say that you know uh, you got to go back to the draft at yeah. a certain age, and whether you're going to military or some kind of social service or something, everybody's got to do something. Well, I was I was you know I I was in the Boy Scouts in the late seventies, early eighties, and so that's where I learned all my civic duty and mm -hmm. constitutional theory, and you know, and then later in college, but. Um, 
You know, and the other thing that strikes me is I was talking to some of my friends. I graduated high school in 81. And um, so, you know, Reagan was huge. And in that early 80s genre, it was like, hey, you know, I, I feel good. I feel proud to be an American. Isn't that awesome to feel proud to be an American? And a lot of the a lot of the vibe of, you know, my Trumpster friends and family members is I feel proud to be an American. Finally, again, we're standing up for America. So, so you know, this idea, you know, America is an idea <laughs> that's that's built on Super Bowl commercials versus a social construct and, and contract. I think there's something there, there, too. And make America there's something great unique and, about exactly uh, right. the United States, though, I think in terms of this authorized versus societal contract which yeah. is that uh, most countries precede and have lived through multiple governmental systems. Mm -hmm. Whereas the US, right. you know, 1776 and 89, uh, it's, it's basically a authorized country mm -hmm. and, yeah. and inseparable from ideology in that sense. Yeah. So it's a little bit different than many other countries, even though a lot of the you know, issues are similar, uh, it's pretty unique. And then on top of that, there's a kind of quality of uh, insulation that America has, which is literally due to geography, those two great sure. oceans. Sure. Uh, I think that Canada could invade at any moment. Sorry? <laughs> Canada, Canada could invade at any they moment. Could. I mean, it's dangerous. <laughs> they could. We, we've and got our trucks right right at the border. But, but that, <laughs> that, that right isolation is, is extraordinary, right? You go to Europe and their gas prices have always been dramatically higher than ours, right? And so they have a much more, you know, uh, gas economy matters more to them at a pragmatic level, whereas us, it doesn't matter because we don't have to worry about that because we're Americans. Which takes us back to policies and subsidies. I mean, I read um, Cadillac Desert and a couple other books about water, and it's like farmers in the middle of the country where they should not be growing crops are able to grow crops because water is delivered to them at $20 per acre foot that is costing like $200 per acre foot to get to them. And these yeah. are the farmers who don't believe in socialism. And then we take those juicy almonds and make milk out of it. Bingo. Yeah. Not Bingo. anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. You know, I mean, if you, well, those of us who live in California, right? And you can see what's going on in the Central Valley and you can feel what's going on here. And my trees are desiccated, even more desiccated than they were five or six years ago. I mean, they're just falling apart. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me, let me, let me yeah, get us back to the positive conversation. Thank you. Um, because I, I, I then managed to hijack us back into this sort of negative conversation. But, but Bo, would you mind strapping on the crampons and taking us into Gewaffenheit? Yeah. I have to go, guys. I, I'd love to hear that, but I have to depart. Are you Do well. Good, luck, good luck with the energy, energy people. We're close. Energy is close. Thank right. you. It's just Bye. a little spark gap away. Are you talking about Heidegger here or something? Yeah, it's, it's the German for thrownness is Gewotenheit. So uh, if you wouldn't mind, just like, how does this relate to what we're talking about? And what is it? Well, it very much relates to what Susan's talking about. And Heidegger uses it again and again. And it's like, when you're in a situation, you didn't choose it. And it just is the all encompassing reality, which you were basically born into. Oh, wow. Uh, so you don't exactly question it. And mm -hmm. all of us are thrown. And this is how you know, you don't choose to literally be alive. You're there's so many ways you're thrown yeah uh, so and heidegger uses it and it's very 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 powerful concept so basically susan could use that term uh, to describe it. throne thrownness heidegger's throne i put a, oh, yeah. i put a link to it in the in the chat there's a wikipedia page for thrownness so uh if you're interested thank you yeah, thanks bo and I, I had never heard of the concept it makes a ton of sense doesn't it um, yeah it's, it's very powerful well, so, it's yeah. important. It's important because everybody is. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we're all thrown into our setting, into our context, into our yeah. lives. Um, so who should we pay attention to? One, one of the thoughts in my brain just, for example, ba -ba -da -ba, here, share screen. Uh, one of the thoughts in my brain is communities trying to fix world problems. Uh, game B Common Future, Dent, Economic Space Agency, the Open Future Coalition, Society 2045, uh, Donut Economics, uh, the Global Solutions Initiative, the Earthshot Prize, Top Tier Impact, the Production Board. Uh, and then uh, here's like regional and local donut economic initiatives. Uh, I've got, uh, you know, 
uh, organizations building the regenerative economy under here, Seeds of Dow, Zero food, Footprint, the Open World Alliance, Hasten Regeneration, Global Regeneration Collab, which is a, a close community to us. I think uh, uh, Dave Witzel is, is like a part of that. Uh, so like, are these people all wasting their time or should we join them all and put our energy behind them? So I'd like to say I'm, I'm very, um... I'm I am very optimistic about we're going to get through this. We've gone through it before, and we'll go through it again. And the first seeds of seeing how we were transforming it was when the the COVID crisis happened. I was very worried about gig workers, for example. There was mm -hmm. nothing in the law saying gig workers got <clears> in, <throat> and it had been scaring me a lot because gig workers. I mean, what health insurance do they have? What unemployment insurance do they have? The system was built for Fordism. It was built mm -hmm. for <laughs> employment and hey it's really neat that the government really did respond and help those people out i mean you already saw that the system change itself to take care of those people and that's just the beginning so i'm very confident that that's going to happen i think another thing is happening that i'm really hopeful about and is stakeholder capitalism uh, so I think that the community and the workers all have a place and, and in Germany, for example, I mean, it's already been in the law for a long, long, long time. Uh, so I think that's definitely on the rise for America too. I think this, uh, shareholder value, uh, dogma <laughs> is, uh, has run its course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's a dead dog. So Go ahead. Up for that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's well, it's gonna it's gonna go down go down uh, screaming and shouting. Sure, sure it is. Yeah. Um, and like right now, it's so funny. You read the financial press and you hear this: oh, well, wages are going up, yay for the poor working people. But then also, uh oh, corporate margins. And yeah, corporate margins are gonna get hurt. That's right. But also, in inflation wipes out the increase in wages. So right, there's a lot going on. So I'm so we already saw uh, we took care of the gig workers, and that was another thing. Like our social. We we needed to redo all the legislation. I'm not sure the gig workers are cool right now, Bo. I'm not sure we took care of them. I think they managed. To oh survive. no, no. But, we, we but they're them starting to. I mean, look at look at the the little nascent the little nascent stuff, right? In yeah, you know, in the uh, in the Uber and uh, Lyft worlds in in other places where it may not be the unions, but um, there's enough just enough flexibility in the financial system because we, people need workers that there's there's some room for people to speak up mm -hmm. um and and they don't have to be you know like all the all the things that we had before right i think you know uh, there's something about this sort of you know when are we going to realize that the small scale is the large scale I mean, that, to go back to Jerry's question, you know, should we join all these? What should we, you know, what should we do <laughs> in the yeah. in the face of this? Um, and I don't know the answer to that, except to note that the answer doesn't have to be, you know, aggregating into great big things. Nicely said. Remember, most people in America are employed by small businesses. That's yeah. true. Do you, right. you ever walk in one of these little businesses and you realize they have like 15, 16 employees? Yeah. You're just, it's just shocking when you realize that this is most of America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, um, yeah. so I don't know, but if the small, if we, if the, you know, to reconcile ourselves to uh, the hope of small scale, <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, it's, it's, um, but then, of course, then it just opens up all the, you know, when you run into, when you run into the thing next door, uh, especially now that we're sort of, you know, separated out, although I live in this thing that became, is becoming a community. Mm -hmm. um, so you're, you're stressed in part. We're stressed. Also, we have this commonality. I mean, we had all these weird things of the people who lived in, the, had property here and who bought into a POA, I mean, an HOA. And, nobody and the people that who are behind the gate that aren't. So years ago, I kind of introduced this term behind the gate and it's taken. <laughs> so pleased, <laughs> you know, patience, right? You're just, just sort of like throw it out there and see what happens, keep reinforcing it. Um, so uh, yes, well, it, we are stressed. 
Yeah. And we, we've been told by the powers that be. And I think everything, other communities in the U.S. are like this too. I mean, Malheur, for instance, is like we're not, uh, we've been told, look, you people live out here, you know, when there's a wildfire, we're not going to be able to help. Well, that's as clear uh, as it gets. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, you, you have to figure out your own exit strategies or your own, your yeah. own survival strategies. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've, I've, my, I have a neighbor who invited me to come jump in his water tank. So stress has these really interesting effects. Um, stress breaks a lot of things in a lot of people, but along the way, it causes some beautiful things. So my favorite music is from Latin America in the 70s. It's the Brazilian Tropicalismo, Argentine Revatrova. It's just beautiful, beautiful music caused by dictatorships that were kidnapping people and, and dropping them out of helicopters into the, into the, the river. Um, and, and so stress is interesting that way. On a brighter note, um, a thing that just crossed my radar recently that's really interesting, uh, Jim Fallows is the senior uh, editor for The Atlantic. He's actually written about my brain a couple of times before in The Atlantic. Oh. He's a big user of Tinderbox. He's a fan of organizing your thinking. And then I did, a, I, did a, I did a podcast interview with David Allen just a couple of weeks ago. David Allen is the getting things done guy. And for some reason, David Allen in the, in the after note saying, hey, here's the recording looped in Jim Fallows and, uh, and another guy. Uh, and it was really interesting because Fallows and his wife, uh, yay, um, Dave must have just finished a different call. Hey, Dave. Hey, everybody. Sorry, Greeting. Uh, no worries. Glad to see you. Um, so Fallows and his wife flew in their plane. He's a yes. private pilot across yep. the country uh, over the last couple of years. They wrote a book about it called Our Town. That's right. Uh, our towns. And then they did a PBS style documentary about it. But now they have the Our Towns Civic Foundation. And Jim's message back to the little group of people on email was, um, hey, Jerry, the stuff that you're doing about marshalling resources for cities and all that kind of stuff is kind of exactly what we're doing. So I wrote back saying, love to help. How can we help? And haven't heard back yet. But one of the most important things I think that the left can do right now is turn toward the center of the country. I don't mean the center ideologically. Mm -hmm. I mean, let, let's go help everybody who feels left behind legitimately and justifiably, who is in dire straits for lots of different reasons. And let's be as clever as can be. Let's like science the shit out of this if anybody will listen to science, but let's go help problem solve and be of service. And I don't mean let's show up and say, yeah. uh, we've done a study and we have best practices and all you have to do is exactly this. Because from what I've noticed in the world, those kinds of help models don't really work. No. Um, you need to be of service and you need to tell stories. You need to have resources, but then you need to sit back and say, what, which of these things would you, smells good to you? What would you like to try? Right. And, that, I, and that methodology, I think, would be super, super helpful. I don't know if it lights up for anybody else. Go ahead, Bo. No, I just, well, I love that. You don't come in and be Mr. Elite and uh, yeah, we'll deal with well, your spy rule and oh. I learned, that, I learned this when I attended a thing called Opportunity Collaboration. So April and I were facilitators for OpCall uh, for two different years back a while ago. And I, this was a kind of like a dating fest between social ventures, like really interesting, like half of the 300 people who showed up ran little social uh, ventures and the other half were funders of social ventures. And it was a little bit like a dating game for three days, ironically at a club med on the, on the uh, Mexican coast. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I know. Good place That's, for that. See? Good place. There you, there you go. Mm -hmm. um, and of all the social ventures trying to do good in the world, there was only one that I ran into, um, which I remembered, and I, I totally remember my, my conversation, where they said, our MO is to go approach a city, a town, someplace in Guatemala or Honduras, or these are the countries where we do work, where we, do, where we operate. Uh, we approach the town, we say, what do you want us to do? And in one case, it was a soccer field. And they were like, don't you need a hospital or a school? And they're like, no, we need to get the kids off the street. And in another case, um, they were about to build, I think it was a hospital for a small town, except the mayor who was kind of, uh, they had an election and the mayor who was a corrupt, drunken asshole basically came in. And so the guy telling me the story says, at that point, we called our funders and we said, hey, guess what? 
we're pulling out of this town. We're not, we, and the, the impulse because of impact investing and all these things is to just put numbers on the board. Like it didn't, didn't matter if the mayor was taking a, you know, taking a slice of the money after a while, we, we built a hospital and the scoreboard lights up and you're like, great, another, another hospital built. But in this case, they backed out and the hospital wound up being built like two towns over in a different town and, mm-hmm. and it took longer and so forth. But, but I love their MO. And, mm-hmm. and what scared me was of, of the little ventures I was talking to, everybody else was like, we did a big study. We've got best practices. We have a methodology and a thing that we just drop in. We're like airdropping some best way to yeah. do things. And that, nothing drives me crazier than that. Yeah. And this goes back and to the emergence, system, emergence versus right authority here. thing you were talking about, Susan. Pardon? This goes that. back to the um, emergence versus authority or authorized yeah. uh, ways of managing that goes back. And that bubbled back to what are the new stacks? So I'm trying to figure out how do we wind up in stacks that have emergent properties that allow us to get to know each other and build community and become citizens again instead of mere consumers. And for me, that's a better verse. And I, I bought the betterverse.org right after Zuckerberg said the metaverse is the thing we're after. Because I'm like, wow, Zuckerberg's vision of the, of the metaverse would have been embarrassing in 1995. Right. Right. But, but we have like the tools on deck to build the metaverse. Mm-hmm. We've got it. We're just not aiming that direction together. Sorry. And I said a whole bunch of different things there. And a couple of you wanted to jump in. I'm curious, Jerry, you, it definitely rings a bunch of bells that I've been wondering about. So but I, I, I got to spend uh, like last week or the week before, I guess, at, in, down in Playa Viva, which is a, a resort on the Mexican coast. But, you know, it's a regenerative resort. And uh, you do look regenerated. Thank you. Thank you. It's just, this is not it. But, you know, it's got the same concept. Um, and, you know, it's fun to watch because he, you know, he started the resort about 15 years ago. He's got, you know, kind of three-sided bamboo houses that are really gorgeous. It's all solar powered. He's got, you know, uh, uh, a solid, you know, kind of water system. He's got a regenerative uh, agriculture farm that's doing a lot of food for the, for the resort. And then he's kind of working up the watershed. Um, they're investing in a school. They're investing in the, the family at the top of the mountain that does the, the cocoa and the coffee plantations, you know. And and there you know you can you can see kind of a, a, a watershed strategy developing, and and I've been increasingly convinced that this watershed concept is really important, and that a lot of our prior development strategy had been too particulate. You know we're going to invest mm-hmm. in schools or soccer, court, you know, but what we really need is that interaction across the initiative. But the initiatives are still kind of independent, right? The school that they're investing in is not the same as the farm. You know, these are separate entities, and and but they have synergistic effects. So, so the question I've wondered about is: there's some way we can develop a structure that supports, you know, effectively watershed co-investment um, that, you know, that would build on the opportunity on the syn- synchronicity opportunities. And I suspect this is what community development, you know, kind of looked like 20 years ago in, in, the, in the United States, kind of urban development had the same problem. That's why we have business improvement districts and stuff like that, where you're trying to do mutual support within a region of a city. But I'm not sure if we've done it as well outside of cities. So anyway, I kind of imagine that there's a platform that lets, you know, a place come up and say, well, we want to develop this watershed. Here's, you know, six different initiatives that various people want to invest in. And then you invite investors to... Yeah, I don't, I don't know this one, Susan. Uh, uh, I do, I do. Uh, I knew Jerry ahead. does. That's why I know about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, it, and then let investors invest in these things. Well, I'll put it in, yeah. And, and then so, do that. You know, so there's some kind of distributed synchronicity, I guess, is the question. Mm-hmm. So I've wondered yeah. whether there's a play in something like that. Um, um, a, cu- a couple things. Uh, John Wesley Powell, the kind of explorer of the West, proposed to Congress that all the states west of the Mississippi uh, that their boundaries be aligned with watersheds. And he sent the map in uh, outlining where the peak, where the crests were. It would have been a fabulous idea. It would have been really awesome. Instead, of course, we were busy dividing uh, these states up around the Homestead Act and also pl- slavery, like uh, free, land, free soil versus slave states and all that kind of politics and crap, which is why there's a North and South Dakota, for example. Um, but perfect order is interesting because it's about the management of water and other things on the slopes of the volcano at Bali. Uh, and uh, it's a really lovely book by an anthropologist about how when the green revolution hits Bali, the, the, 
the scientists almost kill not only farming, but the reefs offshore. Because the scientists say, hey, you need to grow this new variant called golden rice. It's much, it yields much better. It's more nutritious. Okay, good. Then you're going to probably want to put some fertilizer on your soil. So here's some fertilizer. And these little manual gates you have for irrigation. No, no, no. Let's do this electromechanical system. And they failed to notice a bunch of stuff. And then the, the punchline, which I told, I think, in a Rex call years ago. Uh, but the punchline was that the thousand-year-old Hindu rituals that they were repeating every whatever in the temples that, that trickled down the, 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 the mountain uh, contained algorithms for efficient and, and actually almost optimal allocation of which fields to flood, who gets how much water, uh, uh, you know, when to plant, all of this other kind of stuff. It was super interesting. It was baked into what looked like pure religion. Mm. And, yeah. and the anthropologists were like, oh my God, we, we destroyed that. And I don't know how, I don't know what happened after. I don't know how, how they resolved it or what's, what's happened since. Yeah, so I think, I mean, to me, the, the watershed concept is really powerful. And, you know, I mean, this is like in Bali, it was always the, and it's the folks at the bottom of the mountain that wanted, had to control the irrigation systems yeah. because, you know, if they weren't getting the water, they were the ones that objected it. You know, and this is kind of in the Ostrom world and stuff. But I just feel like, I do feel like there, there is a gap between the, you know, all the people who claim they have lots of money to invest in social impact. And there's all these people who say they have projects that will have great social impact. And they're not getting funded. So there's some right. kind of a funding gap. And I don't know how to, I feel like the rule, it has to be changed on both sides, right? It can't yeah. just be one side's fucked up. They're both yeah. fucked up. So you've got to adjust both of them. But it's like, what would the, what would the cooperation tools look like that would enable, you know, enable, you know, okay, so I'm, I'm a funder, I invest in schools. Well, let me invest in schools that are going to support this watershed. You know, uh, right. I, you know I, I care about biodiversity. I want to plant mangroves. Okay, well, here's a watershed that has mangroves in schools. Let's do those simultaneously. I don't know. How do we facilitate that kind of thing? Well, I think this this is probably a, an important one, and it makes me think, Jerry. There must be a way to find out what happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's got to be some update or some yeah, somehow to figure out what did we learn anything, and did the development people learn anything from the process, right? Because because it's one thing to have the light bulb go off that oh my god, by trying to improve this community, we almost killed them. Um, it's another thing to say, oh, we've, we've modified our development process in X, Y, and Z ways, and now we're not killing off our clients. Well, it will be, I will, I will take it upon myself because I, uh, to see if I can figure this out, because uh, I think what this, this book also contributes to in the understanding of the anthropologist, the anthropologist, I mean, I do think the anthropologists are the only, pretty much the only ones who do try <laughs> to go in with an open mind. And, and it, that's the famous story about Xerox and the copiers in the field, oh, yeah. right? That, that, that is the birth story of the IRL where you work, Susan. Oh, yeah. So that, that and, you know, many more. Yeah. But yeah. it is it, the discipline that, that the ethnographers learned is, is the discipline of not judging. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I told this to, we had some anthropologists at IBM and when I went to work there, because I wanted to know how one of these systems actually worked. And I went through the, oh, this isn't so bad. And then, oh my God, it really is. <laughs> but but um, trying to work in that system uh, and they had hired some anthropologists and they were crowing about it. This was long after other people had had anthropologists. Finally, an anthropologist. Um, and then they kept thinking I was an anthropologist, which was not my role there. Anyway, um, enough about me. That, um, what, what's in here is, is a story about what that they unpacked, what was, you know, we can look at the chapters of it. Uh, the, what was, what was the, the Hindu religion doing there? I mean, it's the more, long, older I get, the more I think that what these systems are, these religious systems are, and their practice, right? That it's a practice and it's about how to live your life. So you've just opened a really interesting Pandora's box for me. Which one? Um, well, um, I have a whole riff on like the Ten Commandments. Uh huh. And like nobody knows the Second Commandment, for example. By the way, there's a bunch of different versions of the Ten Commandments depending where you are. So there's no consistent real Ten Commandments. But the, but the usual, who knows the usual Second Commandment? And, and, and don't be embarrassed. Nobody knows this. Number one is, I am your God, your only God. There will be no other gods before me, which is licensed to get rid of the people who believe in other gods, by the way. Yes. Number two is no graven images. 
which all Muslims and Jews obey assiduously and all Christians violate and twice on Sunday. Except like Men Mennonites don't. No graven images. Bingo. We took that seriously, right? That meant no but pictures. It, but no first of all, mirrors. number two, what the hell is it doing among the 10 ways to live a life? Like really seriously, what is no graven images even doing on the list? Well, is, what my, is my question. It doesn't appear to me to be wisdom for, for living a good life. So, so my riff is basically like, throw out the 10 commandments. They are crappy instructions for living a life. And where else in the Bible do you actually get positive instruction? Because it's not, it's not about that. It's about, it's about the practice, which is an emergent social phenomenon. So ignore the instruction manual, just pay attention to the practices? No, well, I would start there for sure. I mean, if I were walking into a situation. So when, when they walked in here and they just threw out the whole watershed system that was in a way, it took a long, painful, yeah. painful thing before. <clears throat> and it looks like if you look at the titles, they must have gotten somewhere because here's tyrants, sorcerers, and Democrats. That's a chapter. Yeah. Hieroglyphs of reason. That's a chapter. Demigods at the summit. That's so, a, you know, that's... They were unpacked. They they really did some try to. They wrestled with it. Right, for sure. I mean, they messed it but, up, and then they had to wrestle with the, the the mess they made. But what you said a moment ago, I, I love, and is is like is a Pandora's box for me because religion ought to be a knowledge management systems for transmitting wisdom about how to live a great society, how to build a huge great society. Mm -hmm. But they don't appear to be. Yeah. It's a lot of command and control structures going on. No, there. right, exactly. And it's the authors, it's the authorization engine. Yes. You can do this, but not that. I mean, that's that's crazy. So um, so along these lines, in a fit of peak a couple of years ago, um, I bought the domain foobarism.com, inventing a placeholder religion because foo.bar is a placeholder file name for geeks. And I was like, if you were going to invent a new religion for the purposes kind of you just described, Susan, what would be in that religion? Wouldn't invent a religion. Well, L. Ron Hubbard did. Well, look where that got us. Uh, exactly. <laughs> no, but but religions are religions are clever hacks of, of ways of getting people to do the same thing. What, what's wrong with inventing a religion? I, I've been thinking, of, I mean, we, I've been doing this. Uh, we should emerge out for... of the practice is what it should do. All right. Uh, go ahead, Dave. The practice, no, go ahead, yes. Uh, I just think, I mean, I, I think this is a very different question than how do you manage watershed, but I think it's pretty <laughs> interesting. No, it's that, not. It, it is. It absolutely but, is not. In, in but that, the, but book, the religion. In that book, it's, a, it's one and the same. The reason I think re the reason Susan went there was that the Hindu rituals contained management practice for watershed. Yeah. Fair enough, that's fine. I mean, the, probably yeah. Hindu, Hindu probably has uh, management practices for many things. We don't have to adopt all of Hinduism to order in order to understand. Well, logic. exactly. Right. But, but but the idea that you're trying to understand movement making and motivation by studying how religions have done it, I think is really interesting. And so we've been doing the Buddhist Sangha where we're listening to the to the to the Rinpoche, you know, read his fucking book in, I guess in Nepali. I don't even know what his language he's reading in, and then translate it in English in English into English. And the last chapter has been around how to have a teacher. And who the teacher needs to be and how a Buddhist teacher is not a cult, clearly. And it's like, wait a minute, how do I know that? You know, <laughs> and it's kind of, but you can see the self-awareness of the deliberately, you know, deliberate trying to, to build the groups and reinforce the teaching and move people along. And, you know, a lot of Buddhism, I think, is got really good messages that the rest of society should learn, you know. And so I'm not all that, I don't feel all that bad about them trying to transmit it. But anyway, it's as far as just kind of understanding the logic of how do you do a movement. It's like, yeah, look at religions, man. They've been pretty effective. Anybody else on this? I would be, except I got to run. So. Oh, shit. Sorry. I'll catch, you, I'll catch you next time. Take care, guys. Thanks for being here, Brad. Yeah. Bye-bye. Actually, so speaking of religion and, and Buddhism, uh, there's been an escalation. You, you all remember Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Indeed. And mm -hmm. Thich Nhat Khan recently died. And he, he had a book out that uh, I, I reserved it at the library. The title was Zen in the Art of Peacemaking. When I actually picked up the book, the title had changed. It was Zen in the Art of Saving the Planet. Mm. And uh, <laughs> I think that says something. Uh, but it's quite interesting because it's, uh, and I, I actually had to return the book because I was reading so many other books also. But uh, um, it, it says something interesting about, uh, you, you know, if we're talking about anthropogenic climate change, 
Anthropos is the key part. And what drives Anthropos? So I, I think the kind of religious, and, and I think that has a lot to do with religion because there's, you know, has a lot to do with an image of oneself and how one positions oneself kind of in a greater, in a kind of huge ecology. So speaking of watershed, I would very much agree that this kind of uh, self-identification, which has many, many religious elements, uh, is, is pretty key. Um, although it raises the question, like, it, uh, in terms of this kind of religious, or and this example of, you know, uh, Hindu traditions uh, affecting agriculture, is, is that authorization or is that emergent? You know? Well, I think, I mean, look, it's, uh, um, yeah, it's funny that you cottoned on to the emergence. We had a big argument, those of us who were dealing with this concept for a while back about, about whether emergence was the right word. And um, because everything emerges, right? But, you know, you, when you have authorization that, that, drives, that drives certain kinds of practice development, then there's the practice development that arises out of engaging with the environment and the people around you and everything else, right? And trying to get things done. Those things eventually kind of come together. And, and when it work, when things work, those are a bit symbiotic. Hmm. Um, and and uh, the the temptation is to formalize, you know, too much, and to uh, and to to authorize it and say this is a good best practice. I mean, in my business, we were in the business of developing practice because that seemed to me that's how you learn right that's if 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 what you know is embedded in practice then develop then one way to leverage at things might be to come in and understand the practice and then you know move it in various ways because you yeah anyway i won't go there that's a whole long conversation but um yeah let me just stop there um i love that i mean how how could we get a new social operating system to misapply, uh, you know, software into society. But, but how can we get a new stack or the, the new ways of doing that are more emergent and less loose and less written down? I mean, what's what's happening in Web three is there's a bunch of people who believe that if you set up a, a, a dashboard of projects, let people vote with either their presence or the, the number of shares they own in the DAO and then uh, have proposals going through the DAO as a, in a marketplace of ideas, that that's actually going to lead to a highly functional organization. And if only we did that well, everything would be fine. And I've got my doubts a little bit about that proposition. Yes, and notice that what's happening though is, is just at the point, what, is that what's, what's being authorized uh, is it's kind of blessing certain aspects of the practice, right? And and that can, and if you keep doing that, then you do get into trouble. The question is, how does you how do you um, well? It is hard messing with practice, and I've had arguments with anthropologists about it because they think it's sort of you know the way it is is the way it is, right? And but you can we affect it all the time. But the fun thing about technology is that it changes practice on a dime. Like I remember writing about instant messaging one month and then some months later hearing somebody on a bus in Manhattan saying, I am me that. And I'm like, holy shit, this is hitting the mainstream. Like th this is already out. And not one of the early I am companies spent a dime on marketing. These, th these things propagated virally because they were so damn useful. Yeah. Right. And so aim ICQ. But you don't uh, need, you don't need, I mean, the technology is an enabler, right? Yes. For that. But that changed behaviors. It changed it like, it, you know, and nowadays nobody can imagine life before smartphones and Google maps on their phone. Right. Um, but imagine, imagine, okay. So there was. Yeah, or, and that. Facebook for all, for all the bad it's done. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Susan. Oh, that's fine. It's true. Um, but it, it, there was a, you know, if you look back to, uh, we had a woman, um, Penny uh, Eckert. It was a sociolinguist who did a lot of work on uh, um, 
jocks and burnouts, which is a, a typical bifurcation in the various forms that goes through American high schools. Um, and uh, and she um, she did she did she would have these wonderful accounts of things like, you know, where where the changes come from. So she was of the the school that it wasn't the Ch the whole Chomsky thing about the change in language comes from the the um, comes from the, uh, the 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 you know in children being born and different genetic things and it arranges rearranges the whole you know innate structure of language that we're born with. Um, but she would look at things like, and she she was of the opinion that, and argued for many years that it was actually change, language change happened in adolescence. Uh, when, and that it was at that point where you were sort of beginning to develop your own identity and, you know, who you wanted to be with and not be with and what you wanted to be like and whether you wanted to be goth or whether you wanted to be this or that and the other thing, right? And that th those were, that was the phenomenon that we need to pay attention to. Anyway, it turned out that on closer and close inspection of a particular fashion, which was way back in the 80s and probably started in the 80s, was for the, um, you know, for in, in especially in, in the black population of skinny jeans and they, it was called pegging, to peg your jeans. I mean, they would get so tight that you couldn't get them on, right? Women do this. Why they do this, I don't know, but anyway, uh, the, um, that, 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 that pegging thing would then, it would, when, it, when it migrated, it migrated very fast across the social system and across the, 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 the race boundaries, across social boundaries, but it would find, it would wiggle its way in. Um, and one of the things that I used to try to figure out was, you know, just a principle to operate on was if you want a certain practice or you think that a certain practice would be good or a company who has a strategy and they want to shift everything, like take away the branch offices and put in laptops, you need to go find where people are, are actually accomplishing what needs to be done, the work that needs to be done, whether you like it or dislike it or hate companies or whatever. It's, um, is that you actually have to, you have to go find it you know, go somewhere where people are already succeeding at what they are with, without the resources of a branch office. You know, how do they get their work done? And, and that generalizes. Absolutely. And you, you can, you know, and just sort of getting people to go there and they willingly went with us. We had, we were assigned these two young women, a staff person and a, you know, promising, promising individuals. And I remember when I and we I I was stuck doing it myself because we were having an uproar in the end of IRL and I was trying to do this project at the same time. Um, so I ended up, you know, and I would work with this woman who was on a staff person, and I said, "So what did you what did you see today? What did you learn today?" She said, oh, "They're just not following the rules." I thought, "What do you mean they're not following the rules? They're not following the rules." I said, well, what are they doing? You know, well, they, they're just not doing it the way they should be. And, and that was, she could not, I mean, it took it days, days and days of, okay, what did you see? Uh, and uh, and tell, me, tell me how they got that piece of paper <laughs> or that decision. How did they get that decision made? And began to open her eyes to what was actually going on. Well, now, of course, that really disrupts a lot of things. But in, the, in that are the seeds of the new practice that you might want to encourage, right? And so getting the people, you take the people, <laughs> take the people who uh, are going to you know, move out of their offices and take their managers and those people and put them together with the people, right? Who, who are already doing it that way and get the conversation going. And the way it worked was really, I mean, you can't document this, you can't put a number on it. But the people said, oh, we can't do what they're doing because blah, 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 blah. But what can you do? And then you wait. That's fabulous. Oh, so well, who, who's, who's doing yeah. this? Who in the world is, a, is using this approach? Where do, I, where do we immerse ourselves in this? What is it called? What? It's not. 
How do we follow the rules of this process? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm dying to live under this regime, use these principles to make change. Like I think that I act this way or I try to. Yeah, but, you do. But how do, we, how do we do more of this? How do we pour some oxygen on this? All right, well, I thought the way to pour oxygen on this was to get people to, uh, to um, so I, I was a fan of practice documentation and I did write manuals. <laughs> uh, for and try to, um, you know, get the Fuji Xerox guys in their knowledge management organization to actually understand what it was to do this. And there was some conceptual work. And then he says, but what's the process? Takahiko. He said, what is the process here? I said, what's the process? The process is go out and look at what's going on. Well, how do you do that? And eventually broke that down into, you know, hints and ways of, you know, how to get into the organization, how to know when you're accepted, how to, <laughs> you know, all the rest of this and to, to co-practice first. I mean, just to go in there and hunt. Um, and if you can get them to do it, it's even better. So it's, um, I learned it from BCG actually, ready, willing and able. Mm. You know, so there were a bunch of principles and things like that. Mm -hmm. People say, oh, you know, we got to have, you got to have the CEO involved. Well, it's nice if you can, but what if you can't? What's the difference between somebody who's a, a champion and somebody who's a, a sponsor? I mean, the you, it's easy to find champions who will want to do what you do, right? To think of all this stuff, but they have no money, they have no power, right? How do you, you have to, you have to sort of pull the system through. Mark, thank you. Um, and we've also to, Go ahead. No, no, sorry. That was just, I mean, I'd, I'd asked this question a couple of months ago and I, I didn't get very many positive reactions, but I wonder how much of our time is spent trying to influence other people's behavior. I think kind of each individual spent a lot of time trying to influence other people's behavior. Which but don't, it's not. Fascinating. And, and I guess what I was, I was, I mean, this is a, a theory for, for maybe both contested, but it's like, I don't think the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. I, I think it might bend towards coordination. You know, like there's always, and so like if you could go, I wonder if you could go through our history and you could see stepwise functions to greater and greater coordination amongst people, right? So, you know, you talk about the, it would try to do it without judgment, right? So like the enclosure movement may have been good or bad, but it, it facilitated coordination or, you know, the, the East Indian corporation, right? That was a step in incorporation. The nation state is coordination. You know, mm -hmm. language is coordination, the internet is coordination, right? The market is coordination, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we're striving for is, I'd say now that the challenge today is kind of a global coordination that we've never really enabled, right? So we tried with the UN maybe or something like that, but like the, to respond to climate change, we need a level of coordination we've never shown capacity for. But we can look for those places where it does. I mean, you know, it, it's gonna be lumpy, the social system, that emerges out of all of this stuff is lumpy, okay? And people, individuals work their way in and through around all this, and there's any, any whole ecology that exists out there. Uh, you know, and, and you, can, you can find people have different roles, you know, and instead of going for the star in the middle of the, the, um, of the community practice, you look for the people who have, who have have belong, belonging, have legitimacy across the boundary you wish to cross. Ooh, oh. I mean, there's an ongoing debate, I would say, in history, right, between coordination via the autocrat and coordination via the Democrat. No. Right? Can we distribute coordination or can we centralize it? It, it is this distributed. Is the fundamental, it, it's it's a pretty the way it works battle, right? is that it's very distributed. This is one of the points of the, new, the, uh, the, the dawn of everything. Yes. Um, th this is one of the points. It's like, hey, people, uh, old societies didn't suddenly go from hunter gatherers who were struggling to make a living into right. civilization when we invent agriculture and suddenly everything is hierarchical and look how look how great civilization is. That 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 is a myth. And what happened was these extremely rich, various forms of decentralized, sometimes switching, you know, shifting for the seasons or for the purpose that that the group was was around, different kinds of governance that often were incredibly like autonomous, decentralized. They were really about how they're, 
how their different tribes learn to be a tribe. Well, and that's, yes, how a tribe learns to be a tribe. That's a, that's a wonderful story. That's the role of a tribe. It doesn't tribe. mean, I think the mistake that often gets made is if you go in and you see and you have a story about how it's working, that doesn't mean it's good or that it's good for society. It means that's what is. 80% of Ethiopian women used to be, I don't know if they still are, um, circumcised. That is yeah. a bad practice, but that is what society had. And if you were not circumcised, yeah. you were not marriageable. Right. And you know what, we did, we did go in and mess with it, right? But notice that, I mean, I don't know that this is true, but I happen to have, know somebody who studied this, but I don't know that person very well, um, is that it was often women who convinced other women. Well, it, it became a norm. You were not marriageable. You, you yeah. would not have a life if you weren't. Yeah. Um, Molly Melching hacked the whole system in West Africa, not Ethiopia, but she's been going from tribe to tribe, talking to the imams of the villages, yeah. saying, hey, guess what? FGM not in the Quran. And they're like, really? And then they have the conversation and it often catches. And once the imam is on board, yeah, exactly. things can actually yeah. change. So right. she's working through the systems. Yes using their documents and and you would think that this would work in the u.s around the bible and the the, the boogaloo apocalypse but it's not well because I think, unless everybody thinks that we're already in revelations well i yeah <laughs> which i think a lot of people do i remember saying that the most important thing when i was in junior high we were at a bible study group and that that was the last person in the world they thought would want a bible study group and i said what they said what do you want to study i said revelation Ooh. And the, the minister said, what? I said, we want to study Revelation. He said, who does? We want to study, I didn't, had two people. <clears throat> That's awesome. Um, and then of course that was going over. We went around the Sunday school, whole Sunday school apparatus, right? Yeah, Do that. Because, because they have a schedule for what you should study when, and there's a whole- Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like, you know- Here, here you go, walk uh -huh. our walk. That's a wonderful story, Susan. Gosh, I yeah. can't do that one. It's really cool. Well, the thing is, I, yeah. I just, you know, it was sometimes, I don't know how I ever got the courage to do that, but I think it wasn't courage. I think it was, I couldn't think of any, you know, I couldn't think of any other way. And it just seemed, he was a fairly intellectual pastor for a Mennonite. And, uh, and we were lucky to have him. And he was willing to do it. Do I remember what I learned then? Not really except the process of doing it. Right, cool. Um, so, I mean, pardon? Oh, nothing. No. So I think if, the thing is you don't, you know, I came from the school of, if you don't care how it gets, if, if you don't care who gets the credit, you can get a lot done. Yep. And that is true. And you don't get the credit. I mean, at IRL, when they handed out, you know, at 10 year anniversary and they handed out all these things, they didn't give one to me. And the director said, I think I made a mistake, didn't I? I said, you made the biggest mistake you've made. And I basically checked out. Mm -hmm. uh, Harry Truman has a quote. It's amazing what you can accomplish when you do not care who gets the credit. I know. It is true. What was and IRL, Susan? I'm not familiar with your background. I'm sorry? What was IRL? I'm not familiar. Oh, with. the IRL was the Institute for Research on Learning. I put a link to it in the chat. Go. Oh. And it was a, it was paid for by the, it was a Xerox Park, John C.D. Brown and co invention. And um, he wanted to prove, show that, you know, technology could affect one of the good things in the world would be education. So it was a technology is going to save education thing. And he sold it to David Kearns, who was the CEO of Xerox at the time, uh, on the, of a, who had written a book called Training the Untrainable. And so somehow the, the technology was going to all be this. And I walked in there and I thought, oh, no. But somehow. Is that how, is that how I met you, Susan, through JSB? Because I No, I'm I think forgetting. it was Esther. It was Esther. Oh, okay. Esther, maybe and JSB. Okay. Remember, I remember you got sent to the IRL 
to got, IRL I, to write one of the. Uh, well, that's that's how I basically uh, there was an issue of, of the newsletter on the IRL, and that's how I met Penny Penny Eckert and a couple yes. of others. Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of got in there and I thought I'm going to run with this and nobody asked me to run the, I just sort of named myself the research director and started in and tried to knit these pieces that I had and, and I thought, well, we're going to have to make money and we have to have something unique and it looks to me like this sort of this social perspective on learning might be something that isn't there because we're so focused on individuals, which is not a problem. We're all individuals. We like ourselves or not. And yeah, so like that. So, uh, and so it was in that sort of transition, it took me, mm, uh, and I wanted that to happen, which meant that these sort of educational psychologists had to go. It took several years. Uh, and it just kept tweaking and tweaking and tweaking. So, so there are so many dysfunctional, brilliant, people with dysfunctional ideas with which we run the world and sorting the dysfunctional ones from the highly functional ones is difficult and not not easy for people buried in the dysfunctional systems and raising an awareness of how to make those choices seems to me to be a civilizational skill we need to propagate somehow so that people find their way into the high functioning ones and away from yeah. the terrible ones and 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 Dave you were talking earlier about the structures of coordination and all that, and, and like the British East India Company and all that. One of these things is uh, the Treaty of Tordesillas, where the Pope basically says, hey, you explorers going out for Spain and Portugal, if you meet anybody and they don't know the name of Jesus Christ, uh, their land and everything they have is yours because you are going to bring Christ to them, et cetera, et cetera. And it was licensed basically for colonialism and to take over the world. And that was a set of legal structures and justifications to do that. Right, and the, the Maori are like the only tribe worldwide who survived yeah. that effect. Um, partly because it wasn't the Spaniards or the or the Portuguese showing up. Well, the they Brits. were too far away. They had they had a little room over there, you know. Geography does know. wonder. Geography geography does wonders, like for the U.S. But but anyway, so often, so much of world history is about the crappy structures overwhelming uh, functioning societies. And one of one of my big open questions is. Can a pacifist, well-run society survive assault from the people next door who have guns, germs, steel, and an angrier disposition, and who are who, and less to lose? It's unclear. Yeah. And the and I guess that you know what I was just positing was kind of the you know a values-free perspective of it, which is yes, and but it was you know but there was coordination implied, right? So yeah, I'd say every one of these decisions had a coordination component. Yeah. And so maybe coordination isn't the right kind of reduction. I like that. I like your focus on at. the coordination. It's just that but, there's good, yeah. and, good and bad. It's, 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 the least, it's, it's, it's the least, it's sort of, yeah, but we don't like the people who go around and cherry pick. <laughs> we uh, cherry pick the pieces that work for them and work to put something together. Right. Uh, the people who know how to do that. Uh, and, and I think, uh, I grew up, well, so did you. That's why we're talking. And how do you actually make that happen? I mean, I, I gave up. I said, I can't, first of all, there's a whole world out there and I wanna understand how it works because clearly we, we can live in this small place and we can do all this stuff, but we're not exactly having fun, okay? And so that brings me to my second book of the day, which is Dancing in the Streets by Barbara Ehrenreich, um, who you must know. And uh, thanks to Teddy moving out of this space and my moving in, I, had, I wanted to move all his books so I could move some books in because my books are my brain, right? And so I'm bringing them in one by one. Anyway, I found some interesting books in his pile, of course, which I stopped to read. And uh, this one is, um, it's a history of collective joy, and it's an uh, it's an assessment. It's an assessment of of the last four hundred years uh, or five hundred years of Western life being full of depression and depressed people, and how and she goes through the history of the loss of ecstatic ecstatic dance, 
hmm. ecstatic aspects of religion and how and, and you know and and how the and how of course the the command and control systems came in and said this is a mess you're violating all the things it turns out it was an exquisitely crafted the exquisitely pra pra crafted practices that you know you had to do right in order to gain the benefit you couldn't just go off you know and have a you know you know screw with everybody you wanted to or anyway no you couldn't do it that way it was it would have it had its own system uh i don't know if she's right or wrong but it's actually um you know i don't know how she got away with this book actually hmm. And thank you for reminding me of the existence of the book. I've totally spaced on it. It's on my Kindle queue. Like I bought it years ago and didn't really stick to it, but. Well, yeah. but see, if you have your books in front of you like this, you go like, oh, wait, maybe this has something to do with caste. So we just moved uh, up two floors in the same building into a place that has room. And we closed down our storage bins, which is a mess because we have boxes all over for, in front yes. of us now. Oh. And they Except will exist for a long time. Except one of the really big benefits is I get to see my books again, which I didn't think was going to happen in my lifetime. I had kind of written them off. Yeah. As my books are just going to die in storage and so am I. Uh, but in this case, like we're going to build some bookshelves and I'll see my books again. So I, you know, I'll be back in that world among the paper people. Yeah. Well, uh, welcome back. I love it that way. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, my house is still full of all my books, double stacked. I mean, thousands. And you have a lot my, of my poor books. renters, you know, would like some bookshelves. So I'm thinking I took off the first thing I brought over was about 25 uh, Indian cookbooks. And I thought, OK, I'm just going to cook Indian food. That's it. I tried making, you know, a cockaliki soup the other day and what didn't really it was it was great, but as cockaliki soup, but it wasn't satisfying. So, yes, I, I, I applaud your move into bookshelves. Rejoining the physical world. Yeah. Um, we, we've gone for a, a lot longer than our 90 minutes. Um, the time has whipped on by. Uh, do either, any of you want to add a couple of thoughts to where we are or things that are still in your in your queue to, to, to discuss here? No, I enjoyed what happened. I don't want to uh, desecrate it. I got to toss in one more though, because yes. it got, it's this tiny one, but I always laugh at it, is that it, it's from you, from you, Jerry, is that in terms of all the, our experiments with coordination the fax machine was one of the bad ones and how we ended up on that thread is crazy but you know at least we chopped it off so. except what? for healthcare wait wait okay i have a whole riff on how the fax machine was a 10-year detour but it wasn't an attempt at a coordination it was an experiment yeah. of coordination that we could have done better with but we yeah. wrote it for a well, while. Well, it was yeah. invented in 1921, and we didn't get around to it until 1991. I mean, Actually, it was invented in like the 1800s. There was a primitive, uh, a very early version of a fax that had a pendulum uh, that would that would drop ink on a piece of paper according to a signal. I don't, I've forgotten oh, what it is. Wow. I probably got it in my brain. But the but the idea of transmission of a piece of, of an image on a piece of paper is is way older than the fax machine as we know it. Right. Yeah, it's very interesting. I've really enjoyed the book, Susan. It's been really fun. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank, thank you, you for sharing. Thank you, thank you for sharing your your mind and your heart and your history and everything with us so nicely. It's like uh, today. Well, thank like you a, for, like a, for like listening. It makes me think. I keep thinking, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? And I still don't know. There's that big question. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. Until, until soon. <laughs> <laughs>